All right, so I want to start off with an anecdote. So this is Mike. Mike was a real chicken who lived in the United States uh, around the end of World War II. And Mike uh, survived his own decapitation. So he's a living chicken with, with no head. Um, apparently, a farmer went out to, I guess, prepare dinner. And Mike survived the confrontation with the, with the hatchet. Um, the farmer subsequently took the chicken to sideshows across the United States. So Miracle Mike, as he came to be appropriately known, um, became something of a celebrity. This is a spread on him from Life magazine. Um, so a lot of people suspected a hoax, right? They thought there was some sort of trickery here. Um, but since the time of Aristotle, physiologists have understood that vertebrates, many vertebrates, can actually survive without a brain. So they can survive decapitation if they don't bleed out and so on. Now, in a, in a laboratory, um, physiologists use a procedure called pithing to prepare these animals. And I'll spare you the, the gory details, but it, it basically involves just using a blunt needle to destroy uh, the brain of, of these animals. So why are we talking about pithing? Um, Here's a quote from a historian of physiology named Franklin Fearing. He says, experimentation on pithed animals, quote, occupied the attention of almost all physiologists who lived during the second half of the 19th century. So this isn't like fringe stuff, right? This isn't just oddballs in a garage somewhere, right, chopping off heads. Like, most of the important physiologists in the 19th century are working in one way or another with pithed animals. Um, and it's not just frogs, they're pithing fish, and birds, and dogs, and all kinds of things. Frogs seem to be the easiest to use, I think, because they're capable of cutaneous breathing. So if they stop sort of breathing the normal way, they, they can still survive. Right, so the question is why all this pithing, first of all, right? Like, what's the, what's the uh, infatuation with that? Well, the story starts in 1853 with a German physiologist named Edward Pfluger. And Pfluger, in 1853, published some really remarkable experiments on these frogs. And I'm going to talk a bit about the experiments today. In a nutshell, the experiments seemed to a lot of people to show that frogs with no brains are capable of purposive behavior, of goal-oriented behavior, if you want. Why is that surprising? Well, many people have thought that purposive behavior is a mark of consciousness. Right? How do you know that an animal is conscious or has its behavior controlled by consciousness? You can't just ask the frog. So many people have thought purposive behavior, that's what we should be looking for to see whether animals are conscious. But if we accept that standard, then of course, it seems like we have to count frogs with no brains as conscious, right? Like chickens literally running around with their heads cut off. We have to treat them as conscious if we accept this standard. So you might think, all right, maybe that's a bit too much to bite off. You know, I don't buy that headless chickens or frogs, whatever, can be conscious. So you can deny that purposive behavior is a mark of consciousness, and many people did in the 19th century. But that move quickly led to a philosophical position that many people have found troubling. And I'm going to talk more about this position later in the talk. But roughly, it led people to the view that no conscious experience can ever cause any kind of change in a brain or in a body. So consciousness on this view doesn't do anything at all. People don't move their arms and legs, walk, talk, anything like that because of their conscious experience on this weird view. So why does it lead to this view? Why do the frogs lead us to this view potentially? Well, it's if we choose that second possibility here, if we're choosing to give up purposiveness as a mark of consciousness, what we end up doing is we, we kind of box ourselves in, right? If you give up this 
mark of consciousness, then it, um, in the pithed frog, in the frog without a brain, then it seems like right, you're giving up that the pithed frog is conscious. You also have to give up that healthy frogs are conscious. Right? The pithed frog behaves purposively. We're not going to say that it's conscious. You better say the same thing about a healthy frog. The healthy frog behaves in a purposive way, but we're still not going to accept that it's conscious. But then the next step is not hard to see. You probably have to say the same thing about people, too. You know, what's, what's the evidence that human beings have their behavior controlled by their conscious experience? You can't point to our wonderful ability to act in a goal-directed, purposeful way. So you see the issue. Um, there was a great clash here, right? And there were people on both sides of this line. And, and part of what I'm going to do today is talk about um, how this debate between the two sides played out. Um, right, so why am I interested in this question? Um, and where are we going? So whether or not consciousness can affect the body is an old philosophical question. And one thing that's interesting about this research from the 19th century is I think it kind of pushes us to ask, so was this old philosophical question, was it settled in a laboratory? We don't usually think of philosophy as involving the kinds of questions you can settle just by going out and running some experiments. Um, and yet, the people involved in this 19th century debate sure see themselves that way. They're, they're trying to settle their scores on, on this kind of debate by going out there and running more experiments on uh, frogs. So did they actually settle the, the, the dispute by experiment? Um, so that's a general question we'll have in the background. I'm also going to just be trying to tease apart which, one, which ones of the kind of big ideas about consciousness at play in this debate actually drew support, actually drew evidence from the experiments, right? Because there's a lot of ideas that get tossed around and a lot of experiments, and some, sometimes it's a bit hard to see where the experiments are sort of supporting the big ideas. So I'm going to try to take things apart and see what's supported by what. So that's what we're doing today. Um, Right, so let's jump into the details. I want to start with a very quick background on uh, physiology. That's the science that was really the, the starting point for this debate. So first of all, very preliminary stuff. Anatomy is the science where we study body structures, right? The structures of living organisms. Forgive me if this is totally remedial, but good to be on the same page. Uh, physiology, we're looking at body structures in motion. Right? It's the functions of those body structures. We're trying to understand how the body parts work, how they do what they do. So the 17th and 18th century physiology had what historians have called an undercurrent of animism. So what's animism? Animism is an approach to physiology that always gives a role in physiological explanation to consciousness or to a mind or a soul. Right, so the idea here is that if you are tracing the, a kind of stimulus, like a, I don't know, a light flashing or something like that, and a response in an animal or a human or whatever, an animist is going to say that you need to look at more than just like nerves firing and you know, sending signals to the spinal cord and then sending, you know. An animist is going to say that consciousness is actually playing some role in this process, right? So the conscious mind is in some way regulating or changing or altering this, this process. So by the end of the 18th century, you start to get a pull away from animism in physiology. So one of the really important figures here is Marshall Hall, um, a follower of uh, Robert White. Marshall Hall was important because he tried to give a strictly mechanistic explanation of reflex action. So strictly mechanistic means he's going he's gonna to give a, a physiological explanation of how reflexes work that has no role in the explanation for consciousness. Consciousness is not involved in these kinds of processes, right? And by reflex, I just mean the familiar, like, you know, something's moving towards your eye and you wince. That's a reflex. So Marshall Hall thought, look, you know, physiologists explain lots of different behavior, but maybe when it comes to reflexes, we can, we can 
um, give a good explanation without appealing to consciousness. Um, right, so that sets things up for our guy, Edward Pfluger. And Pfluger was reacting against Hall and White in particular. He really didn't like the idea that you could have strictly mechanistic physiological explanation. So what I want to talk about first is Pfluger's most famous experiment. Right, so this is an experiment that involves um, a pith drug, a frog without a brain. And this is just four different stages of what he's doing with the same frog. So I'm going to go through it stage by stage. So first here in step one, um, what he's doing is he's got a frog that's decapitated or it has no brain. And he drips a little, so sorry, it's hung on a hook up here. And he drips a little spot of acid on the side of the frog. Step two, what you find is that the frog, even though it has no brain, the frog will actually uh, pick up one of its feet and it will wipe away the irritant, right? It doesn't feel good to have acid on your hip or whatever. So the frog tries to wipe it away with a foot. Um, as far as stage two here goes, that, there were no surprises. Right, physiologist Marshall Hall talked about this reaction, and he thought, look, the fact that a frog, even without a brain, can still wipe away the acid, that shows that we can give a totally mechanistic account of reflex action. What surprised people is Pfluger's follow-up to this. So here in step three, Pfluger takes the same frog, and I'm sorry, it gets kind of nasty, but so he amputates the frog. Um, cutting off the leg that was actually used to wipe off the acid in, in uh, step two. So he washes the frog off, lets it rest a little bit, and then runs the experiment again, drips the acid on the side. Now, if you think that reflexes are totally mechanistic, you would expect that in this last step, you would get the same reflex response from the same acid drip. Right? You put the acid in the exact same place, you would expect that, well, I removed the lower part of the leg, the stump should just kind of wave around helplessly, right? Well, that's not what happens. What happens is that the frog finds another way to wipe the acid off. Again, a frog has no brain, but it seems to be choosing another foot to use to achieve the same goal. And these kinds of results have been repeated in lots of different situations. So you can take a frog that's pithed and put it on a table. And if there's a foreign surface nearby, sometimes the frog will go and rub its side on the foreign surface to try to get rid of the acid, right, after it's been amputated. So it, these frogs that have no brains seem to be capable of behaving, again, in this very purposeful kind of way. Um, that's... That's weird, right? So after Pfluger ran this experiment, there were a whole host of uh, follow-ups. So I'll just talk about one or two of these. Uh, this one comes from uh, a, another German physiologist named Friedrich Goltz. So one of the things people figured out about pith frogs pretty early on is that you can toss um, you can toss a pithed frog into water, and the frog will swim. So that's already surprising. Swimming is quite a complex, coordinated kind of behavior. Um, but Galt kind of took the swimming response and showed that frogs can not only swim, but they can, well, again, swim with, with great purpose. So one of the things that a frog will do if, that's pithed, with no, you know, the frog has no brain, if you dunk a frog like this to the bottom of a tank of water, the frog will swim to the surface. What's more, and this is what's going on here in this experiment, if you do that, if you start the frog down here and then let it try to swim to the surface and while it's swimming up, you take like a bottle or something like that and you basically trap the frog on its way up. So before it gets to the surface of the water, it's caught in the, in the glass. Um, again, you might think that a frog with no brain, what's it gonna do? It's caught. Um, it does not actually just swim to the top of the bottle and kind of bop its nose against the top of the glass. 
it will do that for a little bit, but then it will actually turn around, find a way to swim down outside the bottom of the glass, and then swim right back up to the surface. Again, a frog with no brain can do this. So, surprising stuff. I'll show you, show you one last one. This is also from Galtz's work. So he, he found that a frog, if you um, sort of irritate the, the back part of a frog, a frog will hop towards a light source. So if you have like a bright window in the distance and you irritate the back of the frog, the frog with no brain, of course, will hop towards the light source. Not only that, what he's showing here in this experiment is that if you block the, the frog's path while it's hopping towards the light source, it will navigate around the obstacle. It will like hop towards here and then start going around that way. So, right, really, really, again, apparently purposive behavior in these frogs. Um, okay, so pretty quickly after Pfluger published his results in the 1850s, you get, uh, what for a time was a very influential response from Lotze. And Lotze reasons this way, he says, look, maybe the nervous system of these brainless frogs have essentially been trained before the frog lost its brain, right? So like the swimming response, you know, maybe the, the you know, maybe the frog basically acquired some very complex kinds of habits. And that's all that's happening when the frog is swimming around the tank and doing all these weird things. It looks like purposive behavior, but really maybe all that's happening is like a complex learned habit. Um, and so if we go this way, of course, we can kind of get out of the weirdness of these explanations, right? Um, you can just explain the feats of these brainless fro frogs as really amounting to training and not as, as stemming from the influence of any kind of consciousness. Okay, so that sounds like a reasonable response, but there was a pretty strong rejoinder that came quickly. Uh, sorry, I don't have a, f a frog picture to illustrate this position I need to tell you about, so I'm using just a random picture from the internet. But here's the response. Um, so if you take a frog, that's pithed, right, brainless frog, and you extend its arms and legs in a very, in what for a frog is a very unnatural position, like straight, straight out in front of it, lying on its back. A frog in its natural life will never ever have its legs and arms pulled up and held in that bizarre kind of position, right, or won't in the vast majority of cases, maybe I should say. Um, what you find, though, if you do this with a pithed frog, is that a frog held in this weird position is still capable of doing that fluger task. If you do the whole thing with the dripping the acid, it will still be able to wipe off the acid, you amputate the leg, it will still find another way to wipe it off. So it seems like Lotze's argument doesn't work very well because when you get these animals to do tasks that they have never encountered before, they're still able to do them, right? The frog can't have been trained to kind of do this task when its legs and arms are in this strange position. Its legs and arms have never been in that position. So the response um, did not end the debate. Okay, so the debate goes on for many decades. There's lots of experiments, lots of different issues that are at play. What I want to do now is I want to try to separate out the kind of more uh, philosophical questions maybe or the more conceptual questions from the more straightforwardly empirical questions. Um, so let's start with the empirical questions. There's, there's one kind of main question that researchers really did make a lot of progress on um, during this period. And that's just the question of, okay, suppose we start being a little bit more careful, right? Suppose we, we don't just like chop heads off of frogs and see what happens, but suppose we start knocking out specific brain structures. What kinds of abilities get knocked out as well? You can learn a lot about which parts of the brain handle which kinds of behaviors um, if you're a bit more careful about how you run these, these pithing jobs.
right? And Pfluger sort of set himself up for this because when Pfluger published his original results, he often just talks about a beheaded frog, right, or a decapitated frog. He often doesn't even tell you, like, what exactly he's knocking out in the frog, like what part, where exactly is the cut that he's making. So sometimes with Pfluger's old stuff, it's a little hard to tell, you know, what, what's missing in these frogs that are able to do these purposive acts. So future research um, improved, right? Um, let me, just to kind of break down some of this empirical research, let me just do a very quick um, review of frog brain anatomy. So this is a frog's brain here. Uh, it's much more el elongated than ours. Um, if you just look at the right side of the diagram, you see just a bunch of different brain structures. So this bit here, this is the brain stem. And at the base of the brain stem, you have the medulla oblongata. And that, that structure turned out to be very important in these experiments because when you make a cut um, in the frog below the medulla oblongata, it really, really, loses a huge amount of ability. It, it can't breathe on its own in the normal way. It can't recover its position when it's laid on its back. Um, however, it can still perform this Pfluger task. You cut a frog below the bottom of the brainstem and it can still find a way to get the acid off the, the side. Um, anyway, um, moving up, you have the, the uh, optic lobes right here. And of course, at the top, you have the cerebral lobes. Um, I'm not going to read this. There's a bunch of quotes I'll kind of skip over there in your paper if you want to look at them more closely. But this is Thomas Henry Huxley, who I'm going to talk more about in a minute. And he's just summarizing some of the empirical results involving like what happens when you make different cuts at different parts of, of the frog brain. Um, and over here on the left-hand side of the diagram, you get a summary of what people were finding by, what is this? This diagram comes from 1898. So I mentioned you know, cutting, um, cutting out the medulla oblongata. The frog can't recover its position again when you lay it on its back. Um, it can't jump if you make the cut a little bit higher than that, and so on. So they're, they're accumulating a bunch of these results about what happens when we knock out what parts of the brain. Okay, so I want to call this a pretty straightforwardly empirical question. As soon as people produced replicable experiments showing that, hey, a frog with this particular brain structure loses this ability, consensus seems to have formed pretty quickly. You don't get a lot of kind of, I don't know, hot and heavy conceptual debate over here. You, you, get, you get consensus pretty quickly, right? There, uh, this question, I think, is pretty straightforwardly responsible to, um, to the experiments directly. The experiments are supporting these conclusions in a straightforward way. But I think it's interesting to contrast this kind of more straightforwardly empirical question from two more conceptual questions that really got a lot of attention in these experiments. One of them is Pfluger's original question. So Pfluger didn't do his experiments because he was trying to understand which brain structures control which actions. Um, not exactly. The big issue he was trying to press is this question, which might seem odd to you, but Pfluger is remembered as a, as a, um, for, for his answer to this question. So the question is, is the spine itself an organ of consciousness? Everybody in this debate agrees that the brain is the main organ of consciousness. We get our consciousness at least mainly from the brain. Um, Pfluger thought that the spine itself might also contribute to the production of consciousness, or indeed that he thought the spine itself might even produce its own independent consciousness. Um, so that was really his kind of burning question, the question he was trying to answer with his results originally. I'm going to, in a minute, I'm going to suggest that um, as things played out, it became pretty clear that you can't really answer this question until you answer a kind of deeper conceptual question. And that is, is there a mark of consciousness in behavior? Is there something, some sort of standard we can adopt that will tell us, hey, whenever 
an animal is capable of behaving in this way, well, then we know that its behavior is controlled in some way by consciousness. Um, so there are lots of attempts to settle these two, uh, these two questions by experiment. I think they all failed. And I want to try to explain why I think the, the issues couldn't really uh, be solved just by running more experiments. So first, let's take the second question. The, the question that I'm, I'm going to suggest is sort of the, the deeper one. So to introduce the question or talk about the question, I want to um, think a little bit about the work of uh, George Henry Lewis. Lewis was Pfluger's most important ally in physiology. He was also a philosopher, a literary critic. Um, he wrote quite a lot in his life. And he really brought Pfluger's work to the attention, certainly of um, English-speaking philosophers and physiologists. Um, and he became one of the real important defenders of the kind of general Pfluger outlook. And he also had an awesome dog, for what it's worth. Okay, so here's a quote from Pfluger's uh, original, the earliest paper where he's responding, sorry, this is Lewis, from Lewis's earliest paper where he's kind of talking about Pfluger's work. And there's an important passage towards the beginning where he lays out one of, I think, his important assumptions that lie behind his interpretation of Pfluger's work. And he says at the top here, before detailing the evidence for the sensorial functions of the chord, it will be necessary to fix on some broad and palpable signs, such as unequivocally indicate the presence of volition. We have such signs in spontaneity of actions and choice of actions. He actually eventually gave up on spontaneity of actions but, and focused in the later part of his career just on this idea of choice of actions, right? You get the idea. He's, he's saying, look, you've got to have some sort of measure, some sort of mark in behavior of what you think counts as conscious behavior. Um, but then he goes on and, and uh, sort of foists a dilemma onto his opponents. And he says, whatever mark of consciousness or sign, whatever sign one chooses, experiment, Lewis claims, leads decisively to this alternative. Namely, either intact animals are unconscious machines, or decapitated animals manifest sensibility and will. By the way, quick aside, um, you may notice these characters often use different terms from one another. It kind of makes the historian's job difficult. So, uh, Lewis really doesn't like the word consciousness. He writes about, it's a terrible word, it doesn't make sense. So he's often talking about sensibility and will. Um, his opponents are often talking about consciousness. So bear that in mind. I'm using the word consciousness myself to catch some maybe subtly different ways. Uh, people are kind of cashing out the phenomenon that they're looking for. Um, anyway, so he's got this dilemma um, that, that he's foisting on his opponents. I call it the mechanist's dilemma. And this is me just trying to spell it out in a plain way. He's saying that you either have to find a mark of consciously controlled behavior, and if you do that, Lewis says he's confident he can show you that a pithed animal meets the standard. It, it actually shows the behavior, and you're going to have to say that it's conscious. Or deny that there is any such behavioral mark, but then if you do that, you have to exclude conscious control from pithed animals and intact animals alike. Um, okay, so Lewis returns to this issue over and over in his writing on this topic. He's constantly trying to foist this dilemma onto his opponents. And you might wonder, like, is that really, you know, why does he think those are our only two options? Surely we could find some mark of consciousness that the pithed frog doesn't meet. He, he doesn't present the dilemma as some sort of conceptual necessity. This isn't supposed to just be some like necessary truth that these are our only two choices. Um, instead, he presents it as a kind of challenge to his opponents. So, he, you know, and it's the challenge of a very confident experimentalist. 
right? He says, look, give me any reasonable behavioral mark of consciousness. I'm going to show you, I'm going to be able to produce that behavior in a laboratory with a pith's frog. Um, was he right? Well, so far as I know, nobody was able to come up with some mark of consciousness that only applied to intact animals and not to, um, to pithed frogs, at least in this 19th century context that, that I've looked at. Um, okay, so he often tries to illustrate this dilemma using examples, right? He's not going to give you arguments that you know, again, that these are our only two choices in the universe, but he tries to show you how hard it is to get out of the dilemma with these, um, with a bunch of different examples. And here's one of my favorites. So this is a, an experiment that Lewis runs. It's, it's not on a pissed frog, so this is a frog that's got its brain and head totally intact. But for this experiment, Lewis uh, cuts the spinal cord about halfway down the back. So it just slices the spinal cord in half. And he then drips a little bit of acid on somewhere on the front part of the frog. And what you find, perhaps not surprisingly, is that the frog tries to crawl away, but it only has use of its front hands, right? The spine has been cut, and so it seems to have lost the use of its, its legs in the back. So it will try to crawl away from you while you're putting the acid on its face, but it's, it's, it's like dragging its, its rear legs behind it. So OK, again, that much is not that surprising. Um, but what Lewis does next is, um, I think, quite interesting. So the next move is to say, OK, look, you're tempted to say that when you, make, when you irritate the front of the frog, that you've paralyzed the rear legs. Right? that the legs are no longer under the conscious control of the animal. Right? And what's your evidence for it? Well, look, the frog is irritated, and the legs are unable to move. It remains motion. They remain motionless. Well, the next thing that Pfluger does makes it hard to say that. Right? He then, same frog, cut, you know, the spine is cut about halfway down. But now he's dripping acid on the back part of the frog. And what happens is the frog actually still tries to crawl away, but if the irritation is in the back, below where the cut is in the spine, it will use its back legs only, and it won't use its front legs at all. So now it's still trying to crawl away from you, but only with the legs, with the parts of its body that are below the cut. The, the front legs are just lying motionless, kind of like the back legs were in the first part of the experiment. So his point is that, if the lack of motion in the hind legs when you irritate the front, if that's evidence that those rear legs are no longer under conscious control, well, you have to say the same thing about the front legs, the front hands, um, when you run the, the experiment in reverse. You have to say that when you irritate the back, the fact that the front part of the frog is lying there motionless, well, that must also show that that front part of the frog is not under conscious control either. Of course, nobody wants to say that. That second bit is, that's, that's an odd position to have. And obviously, um, what Lewis is trying to suggest is that, right at the bottom here, that the, the real truth seems to be that each segment, the front and the back, both has its own volitional center. OK, so his point is that whatever mark you choose of consciousness, you have to apply it evenly. You can't just apply it in the cases where an animal is uninjured or in the cases that are, you know, favor your preferred view. Any time you're going to accept a mark of consciously controlled behavior, it has to be applied evenly. And that point is really at the, the heart of what I'm calling this mechanist dilemma argument that he makes. Right? You have to pick a behavioral mark of conscious control, and you have to apply it evenly. If you do, this is what the mechanist dilemma amounts to. Right? If you do, Lewis thinks he's going to be able to show that the, the pithed frog meets that standard, has the behavior that shows consciousness. Right. So OK, this is the mechanist dilemma again. Um, it seems clear that Lewis was presenting this dilemma to his foes because he thought that this second horn of the dilemma 
was really a sharp horn that nobody was going to want to accept this idea that you know you have to exclude conscious control of behavior even from healthy frogs and indeed healthy chickens, human beings, any other vertebrates, right? Um, so that's not what actually happened, though. By about 1870, you start getting physiologists who are perfectly willing to take that sharp horn of the dilemma. They're perfectly willing to say that, look, if we have no evidence that vertebrates behave in a way that's controlled by consciousness, then we should just give up that idea. Uh, this is, again, T.H. Huxley. You may know him as Darwin's bulldog. He did um, quite a lot of different kinds of things. He, he did some important work in physiology. And he weighed in on this debate in a, in a very influential way. So Huxley drew quite different lessons from these pith frog experiments compared to Lewis and, and Pfluger. Interestingly, he actually conceded that these experiments establish purposive behavior in pithed animals. He didn't respond by saying, oh, it just looks like they're behaving with purpose. He, he was he convinced, apparently, that these frogs really do behave in a purposive way. But of course, what he denied was that that purposiveness shows us that the actions of these pithed frogs really are controlled by consciousness. So, okay. Let's go back to the two questions we were talking about a few minutes ago, right? One of them was, is there a behavioral mark of consciousness? Huxley is going to say no. And we had that first question, is the spine itself an organ of consciousness? Huxley also parted ways with Pfluger and Lewis on this one. He also answered no to this question as well. Um, you might at first look at this and think, he could have said yes. He could, he could have bought the idea that the spine is an organ of consciousness, even though he doesn't accept a behavioral mark of consciousness. Huxley actually doesn't, um, he doesn't deny that animals are conscious. He's not like Descartes, who famously denied that non-human animals are, are conscious at all. Huxley thinks animals are conscious. What he's denying is that the consciousness controls the behavior. Um, but so you might think, look, it's compatible with that view that, you know, the brain is not the only organ of consciousness. Why does he say no to the first question as well as the second? Um, and the answer is, well, he thinks he's got some empirical evidence. And the evidence that he gives is pretty straightforward. He pointed out, well, he pointed to human injury cases. So he said, look, in human beings, we know that when you have substantial damage to what he called the anterior division of the brain, so I assume he meant the frontal lobes, he may have meant the, the cerebral hemispheres, um, but if you have substantial damage to the right part of the brain, we know that a total loss of consciousness occurs in humans, right? So humans get hit over the head in the right sort of way, they lose consciousness totally. Um, those humans that lose consciousness when they get hit over the head the brain does, sorry, the spine doesn't kick in and sort of add some extra consciousness along. The person just loses consciousness, right? So his argument is, look, we should assume that, quote, a frog's spinal cord is not likely to be conscious since a man's is not. Seems like pretty straightforward reasoning. We know from human cases that you lose consciousness when you have the right kind of brain damage. It doesn't matter what's happening in the spine. Um, however, Pfluger and Lewis would not buy this, this argument. And what's interesting to me is that in the same article, just a few pages later, Huxley actually acknowledges this. He acknowledges that you actually can't really settle this question um, just by looking at experiments. Let me read this passage. And sorry, by the way, for the distortion. We had some issues syncing up the computer, but hopefully you can read along. So this is Huxley. Um, quote, it must indeed be admitted that if anyone think fit to maintain that the spinal cord below the injury is conscious, but that it is cut off from any means of making its consciousness known to the other consciousness in the brain, here's the important bit, there is no means of driving him from his position by logic. But assuredly, there is no way of proving it, 
that is the other position. And in the matter of consciousness, if in anything, we may hold by the rule, and he uses a Latin phrase meaning, what does not appear and what does not exist have the same evidence. So the human has severe brain damage, the human loses consciousness, the human doesn't, isn't able to observe any other consciousness going on in the spine, Therefore, uh, we should just say that there is no other consciousness in the spine. Nobody can observe it. Um, okay, so what's going on? Huxley seems like he's arguing empirical evidence that the brain alone is the organ of consciousness. But in the next breath, that is in that last slide, he concedes that experiment can't settle the debate. You just have to think that it's absurd to accept the idea that there could be a consciousness that goes unobserved by the brain's consciousness. But so I think it's worth pausing a second here and asking, like, so why is it supposed to be so absurd that, um, you know, there couldn't be this separate consciousness? Um, so all he tells us is that the absurdity of there not being a separate consciousness in the spine is just supposed to come from the fact that we can't observe it. But if you think about it, I think this, this response really just piggybacks on Huxley's answer to the other question we were talking about. Let me explain why. So his claim that spinal consciousness can't be observed amounts to the claim that it can't be observed first personally. Right? You take the person with brain damage, when he says that you can't observe their consciousness, he means that person has no experience corresponding to whatever happens in the spine. I don't know that anybody tried to run an experiment on an unconscious person to see whether an unconscious person would have these complex reflexes that a brainless frog has, but my money is on the, the, brain, the uh, unconscious person still having certain kinds of reflexive responses. We definitely know from paralysis cases that humans who have spinal damage and who lose control over the lower portion of their body, they are capable of lots of reflexive responses in the lower portion of their body, right? You tickle the soles of their feet, they will retract their feet, right? They, they lose control over the bottom part of their, uh, their legs, but it, it's not clear that they won't be able to do the same kinds of purposive actions, um, even below the injury. So when Huxley says that the human with brain damage doesn't have a spinal consciousness that can be observed, he means the human can't observe this spinal consciousness first personally. But maybe we can still observe that consciousness in a more third personal way if we accept a mark of consciousness. So if we accept that certain kinds of purposive behavioral responses to stimuli show us that consciousness is present modulating the behavior, well, maybe you could then observe the spinal consciousness even in the injured human. Certainly, Pfluger and Lewis want to say, you can observe it in the, uh, in the pithed frog. So right, I think that just brings us back to that other question about is there or is there not a third person accessible behavioral mark of consciousness? It's because Huxley took what I call the sharp horn of the mechanist dilemma, right? Like that he did that precisely because he was not willing to accept this kind of third person standard for when consciousness is present. Right, so he's not willing to take purposive action as evidence of consciousness. So that is to say that we go back to our two questions, um, the two more empirical questions we've been talking, excuse me, the two less empirical questions we've been talking about. Um, it seems like this first question really depends on the second, at least for Huxley, right? He's giving a no answer to this question because he's not willing to accept that there is a third person accessible mark of consciousness. Okay, so the debate went on. Uh, it was really interminable. There were endless experiments. This is a quote from uh, William James in 1890, and he's, again, this is in your paper, but um, at the end here, he's just saying that the two sides of the argument can eat each other up to all eternity. His thought is that 
the two interpretations are both consistent with the evidence. And the more experiments we have, it doesn't kind of just choose between the two sides. The, the two interpretations are just both consistent with all these experiments that we're running. Um, okay, so what happened? How did the debate actually get solved? Obviously, we're not still having this debate today. What put it to rest? Um, I think it's helpful to go back to Marshall Hall here. Marshall Hall uh, was that mechanistic physiologist at the beginning of the, or the end of the uh, 18th century. Marshall Hall divided up muscular action, the kinds of action that physiologists are explaining, into four different types. Reflex action, voluntary act action, respiratory, and involuntary action. And he was, as I mentioned before, he was just trying to give a mechanistic account of the first type, reflex action. But by the end of the century, something remarkable had happened, namely that people who were inspired by this mechanistic program in physiology were now not just giving mechanistic accounts of reflex action, they were giving mechanistic accounts of all action. So the concept of a reflex response became something like a model for all physiological explanation, full stop. So the, the mechanists had something like expansionist ambitions, right? They're, they're taking these accounts of the reflex and they're applying it to all physiological explanation. Uh, this is Lewis the year before he dies. Um, and here he's just acknowledging that physiology has become the search for these purely mechanistic accounts of, of all behavior. Um, okay, so what settled the debate? Well, I want to suggest that what settled the debate was not a particular experiment, but it was the fact that this newly expanded mechanistic physiology as a general research program carried the day. Right? It wasn't any particular frog result that won people over. It was the fact that if you use a broadly mechanistic approach in physiology, you can do a whole bunch of stuff that earlier physiologists were not able to do. And what you find in the literature when you look in this period is you don't find anybody producing some aha moment experiment that puts an end to this debate between Pfluger and Lewis. You find things like this. This is from a physiology textbook in 1911 by Walter Cannon, very well-respected um, Harvard physiologist. And he's presenting the uh, pithed frog uh, experiments in a far less tortured way than you would have seen in a, in a textbook or a physiological book even 10 years before. He just says, purposive movements are not necessarily intended movements. It's probable that reaction directed with apparent purposefulness is in reality an automatic repetition of movements developed for certain effects in the previous experience of the intact animal. I mean, that's not much of an argument. He's basically repeating that line that I gave you guys uh, uh, earlier about that Lotsa tried. Remember, Lotsa tried to say, oh, these are just acquired habits. I mean, we already saw that wasn't a very compelling response. Cannon doesn't really care. He, this is all he says. He just kind of gives you one sentence, and then he moves on. He's reporting the Huxley position as though it were sort of established science. Um, so I want to say that what drove physiologists to Huxley's side in this debate seems, again, to have been programmatic concerns, right? It was the fate of this mechanistic research program in physiology and then also in psychology um, that I think accounts for one side quote unquote winning out in this debate. So if you think about behaviorists like Skinner, Pavlov before him, right? Behaviorism in psychology and then allied approaches in physiology, I think just were more successful research projects in general. Um, okay, so finally I want to talk about this question about philosophy. I started off by saying that it seems like there's some philosophical questions here. Where are they and are they getting settled by experiment? just remind you of this old slide here. Um, so this is uh, this business about if we don't accept purposive behavior as a mark of consciousness, we're going to have to have this view that no conscious experience influences behavior. 
Nowadays, that's a position that goes under the name epiphenomenalism. And I have a sequence of slides here on epiphenomenalism that I think I will skip rather quickly through in the, in the interest of time, but uh, hopefully I can give you the idea. So I want to illustrate what epiphenomenalism is with this example. This is John Lennon uh, walking into a kitchen. Just work with me here. So he sees a cup of tea on the table, and seeing the cup of tea causes him to have a conscious experience. Right? He's not a robot. He's not a zombie. He, he doesn't just sort of coolly register the presence of the tea. He has an experience of it. There's something it's like for him to be there in that kitchen seeing the tea. At the same time, Lenin's brain is doing whatever brains do when people see cups of tea. And then in the next moment, Lenin gets his tea, and he's happy. OK, so the question epiphenomenalism asks is, what is the cause of his grabbing the tea? Right? It seems like there's two possibilities. One is that it's the experience itself that's playing the causal role. The other is that, no, it's nothing mysterious like an experience. It's just the brain. It's whatever was happening in the brain caused Lenin to pick up the tea. Epiphenomenalism, of course, says that it's always the brain, or maybe the brain surrounded by a body, that's causing behavior from one moment to the next. OK, so John Lennon has many experiences. The experiences don't cause anything to happen. Right? It's the brain, maybe the brain surrounded by the body. That's always the kind of causal force. So how do we get epiphenomenalism out of our pithed frogs? Well, it seems like we have this train, chain of reasoning that goes something like this. Suppose you stipulate that there's no behavioral mark of consciousness. Well, then, as we've seen, you don't have any evidence that a pithed frog's behavior is consciously controlled. You don't have any evidence that an intact frog's behavior is consciously controlled, or that a human's behavior is consciously controlled. That's epiphenomenalism. So it seems like epiphenomenalism is just taking off from this assumption at the start here. That kind of looks like a harmless assumption. You could say the same thing about interactionism. Interactionism starts off with the opposite assumption. Hey, there's a behavioral mark of consciousness. The same reasoning whoops, leads you to interactionism. So, right. What's uh, difficult about this is that it seems like which side you choose in this more philosophical debate, it doesn't depend on what exper experiments you're looking at. It depends on your initial assumptions. So you might think, like, well, maybe we can assess the assumptions. Is there some sense in which one initial assumption is correct? Um, I want to say there is not. It, that's, it's a bit like asking which is the correct opening move in chess. I suppose there might be some terrible opening moves in chess, but in general, you can't just look at one opening move in chess and say, is that the right move? Right? By itself, there is no correct opening move in chess. The question is how one move figures into a broader strategy played out over time, right, in an entire game. And I want to suggest that um, we should say something like that about the stipulations involved that get this epiphenomenalism and interactionism debate off the ground. Right? They're not really true or false by themselves, right? The question of should we or shouldn't we accept a behavioral mark of consciousness, there's no fact of the matter about it, right? The only question is, well, how does that assumption plug into a broader research program? If the research program seems like it's flourishing in various ways, then maybe we should adopt the assumption. Um, and I want to say the same thing about epiphenomenalism and interactionism. They don't add anything to these assumptions, right? They're, they sort of ride along as free riders along with these assumptions. 
So I think this is a philosophical debate that doesn't really get settled at the end of the day by experiments. Um, they kind of ride along with a broader experimental program. And then if I'm right, then it shouldn't be surprising that the debate ended the way it did. It ended with one research program being victorious over the other, not with some crucial experiment kind of settling things. Um, yeah, and I think I will end it there so we can get some questions. Thank you very much.